Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. In March, I issued Oregon's Stay Home, Save Lives order. I know it was just a month ago, but holy smokes, it feels a lot longer than that. Oregonians have taken extraordinary actions to keep each other safe during this pandemic. We've all felt the difficult repercussions of those actions, some much more than others, particularly in our underserved communities. As we look to reopen Oregon, it's critical that we use science and data to ensure that we can safely take steps forward. Public health experts agree that there are key steps to safely reopening. At the top of the list is a thorough strategy to test, trace, and isolate the virus. We must understand the prevalence of the disease in Oregon. Testing and tracing serve two purposes. First, to diagnose those who are sick, and second, to see where the virus may be hiding. Joining me to go over these details is Dr. D J Danny Jacobs, President of Oregon Health Sciences University, Dr. David Bangsberg, Dean of the School of Public Health at OHSU and Portland State University, and Dr. Dean Seidlinger at the Oregon Health Authority. Oregon's testing strategy for reopening has three goals. Number one, testing should be available for any Oregonian showing symptoms of the coronavirus. If you are displaying known signs of the virus, you should be able to be tested, period. Second, testing must be available for individuals in vulnerable group living situations where COVID-19 is suspected, such as our nursing homes, prisons, and farm worker housing. Third, we need ongoing, widespread, randomized testing to know where the disease may be hiding in our state and to monitor the disease with our at-risk populations, such as our communities of color and our tribes. To accomplish the first two, we must ensure that Oregon has the right kind of testing in every region of the state. At a meeting I held earlier this week, the CEOs of Oregon's hospital systems including Providence, Legacy, Kaiser, Asante, St. Charles, and OHSU, all agreed to a unified approach for managing testing across Oregon. In this approach, testing capacity will be managed not as six separate hospitals, but as one statewide system that will allocate resources to meet the state's needs in every region of the state. This will include building testing partnerships with smaller hospitals in rural parts of the state. When this partnership is fully implemented, I believe we will have sufficient capacity to meet these first two testing objectives. But in order to reopen and hopefully stay open, we must have randomized widespread testing across the entire state. To that end, I'm so pleased today to announce a major new partnership with Oregon Health Sciences University to conduct this widespread testing throughout the entire state of Oregon. This program is a game changer. It will give us a more accurate understanding of the true rate of infection in Oregon and to have ongoing precision monitoring of any new outbreaks. The program is called Be the Key. A random sample of Oregonians will be invited to voluntarily participate. Ultimately, the program will, will enroll 100,000 volunteers. If you are one of those being invited to participate, I ask you to heed the call. We are all in this together, and together we can be the key to beating the disease. I will let OHSU speak to the particulars but this tool is a critical piece in the puzzle of Oregon's testing strategy moving forward. In addition to testing, we have to let people know if they have been unknowingly exposed to the virus. This is called contact tracing. We contact trace in order to contain the disease from spreading quickly and widely. 
Our public health professionals are trained to do this, and we will be staffing up to cover every region of the state. Our goal is to train at least 600 people, including our community health workers, to build out this statewide team of professionals. This team will know how to listen and will be bilingual and bicultural so they can understand the people they are talking to. People who may be wor worried or scared that they've been ex exposed to COVID-19. We know that tribes and communities of color are especially vulnerable to the virus. And we will make sure that we have the contract, contact tracing capacity to engage with these Oregonians in culturally specific ways. These workers will provide people who have been exposed to the disease with information and support to understand their risk and what they should do to isolate themselves from others, even if they themselves don't feel ill. With this overarching strategy of testing and tracing in place, we will safely be able to begin the process of reopening Oregon. Make no mistake, physical distancing will remain a part of our daily lives until we have the security of a vaccine or treatment for the disease. I want to be clear that we will not be able to open Oregon quickly or in one fell swoop. This process will happen much more slowly than any of us would like. However, in certain parts of the state, we see almost zero cases and few hospitalizations. It is my hope that some counties or regions could have the ability to begin the process of reopening as soon as May 15th. My team continues to work with counties across the state on the criteria for reopening. It is my hope that through our combined and joint efforts that we can continue to combat this virus together because we are truly all in this together. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Dean Seidlinger. Thank you very much, Doc, uh, Governor Brown. Oregonians have come together and we've flattened the curve. We've stayed home, we've saved lives, and now we consider, can consider how to safely reopen Oregon. People have made incredible sacrifices with these community mitigation measures we have in place. There have been people who've lost their jobs, their income, it's had an incredible impact on small businesses and large businesses. And these economic impacts impact people's health. But the actions we took have prevented 70,000 infections here in the state and 1,500 hospitalizations. And we need to be proud of Oregonians coming together to achieve that. I wanna talk about some of the details that Governor Brown outlined and how we are considering safely reopening Oregon based on the research and the data in front of us. Our public health parameters on how the disease is behaving, our strategy to expand testing, how we will work to isolate um, new infections so that they don't spread it to others. But I also wanna underscore that the strategy is not without risk. Our projections show that the disease will increase in Oregon as we open up, that more people will be hospitalized and possibly even die. So we need these measures in place to mitigate that and everyone will still have a role to play to keep us all safe. So what are we looking for? We wanna see a slowing of the spread of this disease in the state. We'll continue to monitor folks presenting to the emergency departments with symptoms consistent with COVID. We will consider to continue to look at our average number of new cases so that we can make sure that our public health capacity and our local and tribal public health departments and with support of the state can continue to investigate and manage those cases. And we wanna make sure that our hospitalizations, that people who are sickest with COVID-19 are going down so that we know that our hospital capacity will exist to care for the Oregonians who do get sick and the Oregonians who continue to need our hospital system um, for other care that hasn't stopped just because of this global pandemic. We know that we need to have the resources there and public health has been doing a great job here in Oregon. Our local public health authorities, our tribal public health partners continue to investigate cases, continue to support those individuals and their families um, throughout this situation. 
and we know that we will need additional people and resources to make that happen over the months and potentially even longer to come while we wait for a vaccine that can prevent this disease. As you've heard, testing is key to our strategy, and testing has been gradually increasing throughout the state. The guidelines of who gets tested in Oregon have continued to evolve, so we make sure that those at highest risk for the disease and those who are um, most likely to be exposed to the disease in hospitals, congregate settings, and elsewhere get that testing. And as the capacity has increased, we've expanded who should be tested and are now recommending to providers that if they see someone in front of them with mild symptoms of COVID-19, that they test that individual so we can identify if they had the disease or not. Those symptoms would include cough or shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, or at least two of the following symptoms, fever, chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pains, headache, sore throat, or new loss of taste or smell, which we know is a unique symptom that comes up with this virus. There are individuals who are more at risk, healthcare workers, um, long-term care facility workers, but those other Oregonians who continue to work and provide us services during this time, the folks at the grocery store, delivery people, our transit workers, our um, farm workers who are out making sure that we have food that comes to the grocery store and to our table. Certain segments of our population through nothing that they could have done are at risk. Our African American population, Native Americans, Latinx population, which have been more severely impacted here in Oregon as they have across the um, country, and we want to ensure that they get tested. We want to use all the resources, and as you heard from Governor Brown, we've worked collectively with our hospital systems to ensure that um, if there's capacity in one area but not in another, that we can ship those specimens to that um, lab and that we can make sure that everyone who needs a test can get a test and that we have timely results, not just for that individual, but for our public health response. <coughs> That testing capacity continues to increase. We continue to see supply chain shortages, but those are easing up. And we have multiple different platforms and different machines that labs are using. So we hope, and we haven't seen them all go down at once, so that we know with this unified um, front, we can move forward more comfortably together. The number of tests performed per week, we think is about 15,000 right now is where we need to be. But that's not the baseline forever. And as more people move about, and we test more people with mild symptoms, that number will need to increase um, over the coming weeks. And we feel that we have the capacity right now to do that. And with our capacity, with our commercial lab partners and others, that we will continue to increase that capacity. But we want to do so methodically. And that's why you've seen the evolution of our guidance. We are going to have some of those um, tests set aside for our public health investigations in long-term care facilities, congregate settings, our Department of Corrections facilities, as well as some surveillance activities that will complement um, some of the activities you're going to hear about today, as well as some of our other um, academic partners. As you heard, we need the ability to trace, to contact everyone who has the disease, identify who they may have been in contact with that could potentially be infected, and work with them so that they can safely stay home have the services they need, and reduce the spread to others. We won't eliminate the spread of COVID-19 in Oregon with people being able to infect others before they have symptoms or even those who never have symptoms, but we hope to slow it as much as we can. Our modeling has shown us that right now we've decreased transmission in Oregon by about 70%. And that isn't because of the people sitting at the table. That's because of all of you coming together and making sacrifices. So as we open up and people start um, going about more and returning to some sense of normalcy, we know that there's going to be an increased risk of spread. We hope that with our tracing and testing and investigation, by isolating people at home who are sick and quarantining those who are home who may have been exposed, we can prevent the spread and not see a surge that may overwhelm our healthcare system. <coughs> All of us working together, our physical distancing really has worked. The sacrifices we made are, are tremendous, and we will work together as a society to overcome those so that we can um, mitigate the impacts that this has had. We know that our infections will go up, and we hope to be able to control that. And that's why it's vital that the state and our local partners and our tribal partners continue to implement our testing and contact tracing strategy effectively, that we work together as one but it's important that all of you have a part. That if a, wearing a, a face covering is recommended, that you do that to protect those around you. That we try and stay six feet apart. 
that we hold off some of those um, trips and vacations that we were planning um, until we have this disease under control and we have a virus and together we'll get through this. And I'd like to turn it back over to Governor Brown. Thank you, Dr. Seidlinger. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Jacobs. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Governor Brown, for your support and your leadership and to you, Dr. Seidlinger, for your expertise and continued partnership as well. So COVID-19 has presented medical professionals, healthcare experts, data scientists, and social scientists with a career-defining challenge. As a society, we have experienced few things as devastating as the widespread impact of this disease. Some have described it as a once-in-a-century event. There really is no complete rule book for this disease. We're learning as we go, making informed decisions based on best practices, proven science and research, and real-time data being collected every day. With a lot of hard work, as you have heard, Oregon has successfully flattened the curve, and we should be proud of our state for taking swift action, as well as our health systems for great collaboration. However, our work is not finished, and we must proceed with extreme caution, in my opinion. If we move too quickly in resuming our pre-COVID-19 lives, we put ourselves at increased risk of a secondary or a second wave of infection. OHSU is proud to partner with the State of Oregon, the Oregon Health Authority, and the OHSU-PSU School of Public Health on a plan to help get Oregon back to our new normal while play, paying very close attention to the risk of future COVID-19 outbreaks. This key to Oregon study will allow us to better understand where the disease is located, how common it is, and how it might be transmitted around the state. This is information, as you've heard, that will be collected in real time, and it will provide useful information that will help get people back to school more safely and back to work faster. And, as you've heard, it is very important to note that this effort could help us prevent or decrease economic and social harm by collecting information about COVID-19 in vulnerable populations and communities. So as you heard, the study has two main components. The first is symptom monitoring, monitoring and surveillance and tracking of 100,000 organs who will be selected at, at random. And we will make sure that the state's ethnic, socioeconomic, and geo geographically diverse citizens are appropriately represented. The second component, as you've heard, is testing. So people who are selected to participate will receive an invitation starting the week of May 11th and again, participation is strictly voluntary. But we believe this study will provide valuable, critically important baseline data about the virus in Oregon and how it behaves to help us make informed, data-driven data -driven decisions that will help us manage through the pandemic until we can develop a vaccine. Now, for those who are interested, we have more information about the study available on our website. That's uh, ohsu.edu forward slash key study. So I'd like to close by thanking the team of people at OHSU who worked on this project. Uh, these included our clinicians, our scientists, and administrators. But I'd like to especially acknowledge uh, the tremendous efforts of Dr. Bangsberg from the OHSU PSU School of Public Health, who was the principal architect for this proposal and also heads OHSU's uh, COVID-19 task force. Um, we'd also like to recognize the contribution of Dr. Brian Duker, head of the Knight Cancer Institute, as well as the principal investigators on this study, Dr. Jackie Shannon and Dr. Paul Spell Spellman. Um, I think I should also call out uh, our chair of pathology at OTSU, Dr. Hansel, as well as collaborators from infectious disease, as well as our experts at our uh, Vaccine and Gene Therapy Institute. Finally, I'd like to thank, we'd all like to thank all Oregonians for their commitment to addressing COVID-19. Partnerships and collaboration have been instrumental to our success so far and will continue to play, to play a key role going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. Uh, we appreciate your leadership and the strong partnership with OHSU. With that, unless you want to make any remarks, you're good? Okay, we're going to take questions. Uh, good morning. I have a question about testing. Uh, Governor Brown, you said that you have wanted to see uh, 15,000 tests, so the capacity for 15,000 tests per week in order to kind of start going back to business as normal. 
So I have a two-part question. One, what is the current testing capacity per week? And two, how many tests are actually being conducted per week? Thank you, Claire. I'm going to turn that over to Dr. Seidlinger um, to answer the question. Thank you. That question about, was about our current testing capacity and how many tests are being done. We currently feel that with the capacity we have, we can meet the 15,000 test goal. This is amongst our Oregon State Public Health Laboratory and the healthcare partners within the state. That doesn't even count some of the larger commercial labs that we're able to tap into for surge capacity as needed. This week, we've done over 2,000 tests on two days, um, and I think that's due to the um, increased um, number of populations or the increased populations that were included in the testing guidance last week, and we anticipate that will expand um, with the guidance that we're releasing today, recommending that those with mild symptoms be tested as they seek care. Um, so, you know, our, our daily testing capacity has been over 2,000, um, has been above 1,000 and close to 1,500 every day this week. Um, so we're nearing that 15,000 number right now. Claire, the only thing I would just add two things. As we are moving into reopening, we're deploying different testing strategies. Um, this is about making sure we have the right tests in the right location, and that's why the partnership uh, with our hospital labs across the state is so crucial. Great. Thanks, Claire. Uh, next question. Oh, just a reminder for everyone, if you're uh, waiting to ask a question, please press zero to get into the question queue. Uh, our next question is from Morgan Romero from PGW. Go ahead, Morgan. Morgan, are you there? We'll go next to uh, Dick Hughes. Go ahead, Dick. Thank you, Kadir. Are we okay? Yes. We can hear you great, Dick. Um, Governor, you talked about this rolling out to rural hospitals and this rural network. How soon uh, will that happen? And how will this tie in with the, um, the expectation that rural parts of Oregon might be among the first to open up. Thank you. Uh, I'll respond to the rural uh, communities opening up. I'm, I'm meeting with a number of rural counties uh, this afternoon over Zoom, of course, and going to be talking about uh, their ability to test, contact trace, and isolate uh, as we begin the reopening phase. As I mentioned in my remarks, um, assuming these counties have these processes in place, um, that would enable us to safely and slowly begin the reopening process on May 15th for some counties only if they meet all of the criteria. Dr. Seidlinger, you want to talk about the testing capacity in rural Oregon? I think our hospitals in rural Oregon can utilize multiple mm -hmm. strategies to bring testing to their communities. Many of them have existing relationships with our larger health care systems that do testing in-house, and we would hope to build on those relationships get, to get the tests to those labs. Um, the state will utilize couriers and other methods to help move those tests around if, if that is not available right now. In addition, um, the federal government has provided some um, point-of-care testing machines to the state of Oregon um, produced by the Abbott Corporation. They came with very limited testing kits. But those testing um, machines um, were scheduled to be deployed to rural Oregon. The first three were deployed with our initial testing kits, and we just received word that we have additional testing kits coming in. That means that we can increase the capacity at the point of care in some of these settings that haven't had it now. Um, we'll continue to look at other technologies as they become available and assure that if the lab capacity doesn't exist in a community, that we have ways of bringing those specimens from that community to the lab, and we will all work together to get that done in a timely fashion. Dick, we see this as a partnership uh, between our state uh, public health uh, agency and local public health uh, divisions in counties around the state, and we expect it to be a strong partnership. Thanks, Dick. Uh, Thanks. I think I think we have Morgan Romero back. Go ahead, Morgan. Yeah, hey, Morgan with KGW. Apologies about that. The stream was delayed. Um, my question is, you know, we've been talking about expanding the ability to test and then the discrepancy between that and the actual testing going on, and testing is the key to reopening, and we can do these thousands of tests. Where is the disconnect, and, and quite specifically, 
you talked earlier, uh, Dr. Feidlinger, about ex you know, loosening those guidelines around who can get tested when they go and visit their providers. Specifically, what might that look like and is that disconnect going to be bridged now? Thank you for that question. That question is about our testing capacity and as it's increased, why we haven't fully utilized that. As I said, you know, we, we made sure that we took a cautious approach to testing here in Oregon. We know that there are populations who are more at risk because of their profession, our healthcare providers, those who work in long-term care facilities, because of the um, place where they work or live, those who are in congregate care facilities, those who work in healthcare facilities, um, because of their background, our African-American, Latinx, um, Native American populations, and those other employment people who are working in places we didn't think about before this, our bus drivers, our grocery workers, and others. So as testing capacity has increased, we've updated our guidance to prioritize those who need it most. And now that we're at a place where we feel our testing capacity um, can meet the needs, and we can surge that up with our hospital partners, as well as those out-of-state commercial labs, that we really wanted to be explicit with our providers in today's guidance, that if they see someone with mild symptoms, they should test them that we still prioritize those other populations and we want to remind them of the complications in those populations, their increased exposure, but really if they see someone with tests, with symptoms of COVID-19 in front of them, we want them to test. And that guidance really has evolved along with our testing capacity. Um, just with the changes we made last week, as I said, we've seen two days where we've tested and had results from over 2,000 people. So I think our healthcare providers are, are heeding those guidelines, are paying attention, and we hope that as the updated guidance comes out today, they will continue to test more individuals because that is one of the keys that we have um, to seeing that it's safe for us to reopen and to initiate those public health investigations that are gonna be key to keeping us all safe. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, we're going to go next to Andrew Selsky with the Associated, Associated Press. Go ahead. Andrew, are you there? All right, let's try uh, Lisa Balick with Coin. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh. oh. <laughs> I shut that for a second. Go ahead, Andrew. Okay, well, this, this is quite the announcement about. Um, the, uh, the random testing across the state involving 100,000 people. Um, when do you plan on starting that? And is Oregon setting a precedent uh, here or have other states uh, begun uh, similar programs? Thank you. Andrew, I'm gonna turn that over to Dr. Bangsberg and uh, Dr. Jacobs. Um, well, thank you for the question. Uh, I think the first was 100,000 and when we would get started. And I think the second part of the question was, is this leading the way or is there, uh, are there other states that are taking similar approaches? The first would say, uh, first I would say that we expect to be able to send out the uh, announcements inviting folks to participate by uh, May 11th, or at least the week of May 11th. I, I would also say before turning it over to Dr. Bangsberg that, you know, uh, our experts, including Dr. Bangsberg and others, looked around the country to try to identify the best approach. And so there are some states that are starting, but I think uh, we have an opportunity to accelerate uh, the impact and learn from the information. Uh, this is David Banksberg. Thank you for the question. I think many states are considering the same approach and uh, making plans. I think it, this is the best possible approach to understand how we prevent a second wave. And so we, as Dr. Jacob says, we will launch uh, with invitations on May 11th and uh, collect, uh, be, immediately begin collecting data. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from Lisa Bailey with Point. Go ahead, Lisa. Good morning. Um, two questions. First, Governor, how is Oregon different than Washington, where the stay home order has been extended? Uh, in terms of specifics, um, I, I, I would say that we are uh, marching on similar paths, but we're taking uh, different trails off of that path. Um, and uh, we are uh, moving forward in Oregon based on science and based on data and based on the in input of uh, medical experts. As you know, I've been meeting regularly with my medical advisory panel and working very closely with the Oregon Health Authority in terms of our uh, reopening framework. I don't have any further details about Washington's at this point in time. 
I do know that Governor Inslee was quite frustrated that he uh, closed down uh, construction and manufacturing and wished he'd taken the approach uh, that Oregon took. Dr. Seidlin, can you add anything? I can't. No, I, I think the same way that Governor Brown has been talking with her, with Governor Inslee and Governor Newsom, in public health, we've also been having conversations and really are using the data, the spread of the disease in our community, its behavior, what we know about the disease, um, to make um, recommendations um, to safely um, open up Oregon and to do so in a way that will prevent um, increased infections. Um, so we share best practices. Um, we, we talk about kind of frustrations and, 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 and try and get answers um, from our colleagues. And I think that spirit of partnership um, continues um, as we go forward and we'll learn things from each other and, and that'll make us all stronger. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, next up, we have- uh, Follow up on that, just quick, quick follow up on that. Um, the other second question is, what about the Portland metro area? What's the expectation for the time frame for the Portland metro area to reopen partially? Uh, Lisa, I would just say generally, uh, we're working on the criteria for reopening in, uh, in counties that have seen uh, more than five cases of the coronavirus, and uh, we'll be releasing those details uh, soon. Next up, we've Not got this month. Lisa, we've got soon. a lot of people in the queue as well. <laughs> so next up, we've got Adam Duvernay from the Register Guard. Hi, I'd like to uh, better understand how and who will be choosing the 100,000 Oregonians for random test? Can you explain the process and who will be conducting it and how Oregonians should be uh, expected to be contacted if they're chosen? Thanks. My only comment on this is that it is voluntary for Oregonians to participate. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bangsberg. We will identify 100,000 Oregonians uh, from, random, from a household uh, sample and we'll send an email or letter out on May 11th to invite people to participate. Uh, once they voluntarily accept participation, then we will enroll them and follow them for one year. Uh, next up, yeah. I'm sorry, did you say it's an email and a letter, or is there an email or a letter? A letter. Oh, it's just a letter, and that date was? May 11th. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, Governor, on uh, the reopening, you said that the criteria is still being uh, devised. I think uh, the average Oregonian is going to be confused about what reopening means. What do you envision, what can you share with rural Oregonians for when a rural county can open? What, how life will change for that rural citizen in those early days? What can they do different than they can't do now? Uh, great question, Les. Um, I, I want to be clear that we're not going to be able to reopen Oregon uh, with uh, quickly or in one fell swoop. This is not like a light switch. Um, I think some of my colleagues across the country have been using a dimmer. Um, the process is going to happen much more slowly than any of us would like. Um, but in certain parts of the state, we're seeing uh, zero cases and few hospitalizations. And it's my hope. Um, that counties or regions um, in, that have seen these few numbers could begin the process of be reopening as soon as May 15th. I'm meeting with a number of the Eastern Oregon counties uh, this afternoon via Zoom and more uh, counties uh, next week. And we'll be talking about their uh, work uh, to partner with us around uh, testing, contact tracing, and isolation. Um, in terms of the sector guidelines, um, my team is meeting with folks who are doing the work, actually working in restaurants and working in malls and uh, meeting with them. And those uh, sector guidelines are still being developed and we'll be releasing that information soon. But what I would say to all Oregonians is this, um, regardless of what phase you are in in terms of reopening, um, we are still going to have to be careful in terms of spreading the virus. That means you will still need to comply with social 
distancing, which we are now calling physical distancing. Um, we are obviously uh, asking folks to wear masks when they are in public uh, to protect others. Um, we, would con we will continue to ask folks to abide by good hygiene efforts, washing your hands thoroughly. When you cough or sneeze, do it into your elbow or a Kleenex. Um, you know, handshaking is probably out the window for a long time. So, Les, I, I wish I could tell folks in Eastern Oregon that our lives are going to get back to normal. It is just going to be a different type of normal. And until we have a vaccine or we have medicine, um, we are going to have to be extremely careful uh, regarding the virus. Could I ask a follow-up? Go ahead, Les. Uh, so, Governor, in, in, again, these conversations talk about the gradual reopening, but you'll be doing monitoring uh, in, in the, all these areas. That implies there's a, there'll be a mechanism for clamping down again if a virus uh, outbreak occurs in a rural area or any area that's opened up. So can you be clear that that will be a tool the state maintains that you can uh, go back to tighter restrictions as the circumstances might dictate? Yes. Um, we will maintain those tools if we need to, obviously by uh, proceeding cautiously and carefully and incrementally. We're, we're hoping to not have to take steps backward. Um, last week when I talked about this, I talked about um, growing up as a kid in Minnesota and we would go ice skating on the ponds and you could take, um, as the, the lakes and the ponds froze over and you wanted to skate, you would like be very cautious about going out onto the ice. You would take one step forward. If the ice didn't crack, if you didn't fall in, then maybe you would take another step. But if you started to hear cracking or if things uh, felt uh, very uh, insecure, you would move backwards. And that's exactly where we will be. I don't know if Dr. Seidlinger wants to add anything to that. No, I would just say, you know, as we continue to monitor the disease today, we will continue that um, as we move forward. We will look for early warning signs, whether it's from our OHSU PSU study um, that will be sampling across the state or the data on reported cases or who's coming to the emergency department so that we can act quickly if we see something out of, out of the ordinary or something that's increasing. If that's something we think can't be contained with the resources we have, we will have those discussions with Governor Brown uh, about um, additional steps we may need to take um, because we want to do this carefully. We want to uh, maintain the safety of Oregonians and we know that we're in this together and Oregonians have shown that they can take steps and make sacrifices to prevent the spread of this disease and we hope they'll be with us as we go forward in, in making some of those sacrifices. Thanks, Les. Uh, next up, we've got Brad Schmidt with the Oregonian. Go ahead, Brad. Hi, Governor. Thanks for your time. Um, I, I want to preface this by saying that we know that Oregon has a low infection rate and that many parts of the state are looking to eagerly to reopen. Um, having said that, um, I'm curious if you are concerned that based on the modeling that shows infections and hospitalizations could jump uh, particularly at the 50 percent level that if in two months we'll be looking back on this moment and questioning whether we should have waited to reopen um, particularly in light of the fact that you know our contact tracers of 600 is about half of what some national organizations say is needed and that our testing rate of 15,000 per week is less than half a percent of our population I think, Brad, that um, our efforts uh, to move forward gradually and incrementally, taking steps based on science and data, are the, is the right approach. We can't stand still, and so I think it's really important um, that we take gradual and incremental steps forward um, to protect uh, the health and safety of Oregonians. Dr. Seidlinger. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Governor. Um, I think those numbers you quoted, Brad, are where we want to be now and in the near future. Those 15,000 tests I, we can do now, and we anticipate that that will increase in the coming weeks 
as we test more people with mild symptoms and as potentially more people are infected as we open up parts of Oregon and people have more contact with each other. That's not a static number, and in a month from now, we will probably be talking about a higher goal and a higher number of tests that we've done per week. The 600 contact tracers is also an initial goal. Those will augment the existing public health workforce amongst our local, tribal, and state public health colleagues. That includes people who have been pulled from other parts of public health to work on COVID-19 right now. We know that they will need to continue to do those other jobs in public health, so we want to let them go back as we identify these 600 additional individuals and add them to the team. And if we notice that we need more, we will add more folks. That 600 number, like the testing number, isn't static, and we want to be able to ramp up and respond to what's happening in Oregon so that we can adequately and appropriately do the investigations, contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine to keep Oregonians safe. Brad, and I also think it's important for Oregonians to understand that the reason why we have a low rate of COVID-19 is because Oregonians across the state made tremendous sacrifices to comply with uh, the aggressive and early executive orders that I put into place. Um, and as a result, um, as you can see from what's happening across the country, um, a lot of the equipment and supplies, particularly around testing, went to hot spots um, in places like New York, Louisiana, Detroit, Michigan. Um, and we, along with a lot of other states that have lower rates of COVID-19 disease, have struggled to get the testing supplies that we need. The good news is, um, is that we are gradually increasing our testing capacity, and um, I am uh, relatively optimistic uh, about our ability to meet uh, the plans we've set forth. Thanks, Brad. Uh, we've just got a few more minutes left, so I'm going to try and get through a few more questions. Uh, next up is Lincoln Graves with K2. Go ahead, Lincoln. Yeah, I, I had a sort of three uh, points I wanted to ask you about with this Be the Key study. Where are the names being chosen from? Are, like, are these from voter rolls or something like that? And are we talking about 100,000 people actually getting tests, or are they just being monitored? And also, where do antibody tests fit in, if not in this study, in any other capacity that the state is looking at? Uh, Lincoln, I'm going to turn that over to Dr. Bangsberg. Uh, thank you very much for the question. The list will be identified from a list of households throughout Oregon with over-representation for communities of color, Latinx, and Native American households. We will provide symptom monitoring to every person in the study. When they develop symptoms, we will provide a COVID PCR test. We will also test an additional or follow an additional 10,000 people who are asymptomatic and provide testing for those individuals to look for asymptomatic infection throughout Oregon. So Lincoln, this is um, oh, Dean Sothinger. I'll follow up on your serology question. The serology tests that are on the market now haven't gone through the same FDA testing that usually happens. During this pandemic, they've released many um, tests that are under their emergency use authorization without as much data telling us how those tests perform um, and how they'll perform in the real world. We know there are several communities and large healthcare systems and others that are doing serology testing in their communities and seeing what they're obtaining based on the infection rates in their community. We hope to learn from that and as the tests um, have more data and we know more about the validity of these tests to be able to make recommendations for deploying them across Oregon. The, that you know, will happen over time and will evolve and it will be another tool for us. We also anticipate that as our academic partners step up additional research that there may be some of them who are inco incorporating serology or antibody testing into their plans. And you know, we look forward to having all that data, not just from Oregon, but from other communities that can help us um, determine how has the disease spread, who shows evidence of the antibodies, and that hopefully we can demonstrate that that evidence of antibodies is evidence of protection as well. Um, so that'll be an evolving process, and we continue to look at the data as it comes out. But right now, it's hard to tell the validity of some of these tests with the way they've been released so quickly. Um, so we're looking for additional data to make those recommendations. Thanks, Lincoln. Uh, the next question is a written question for Dr. Seidlinger. 
Uh, Fedora from the Oregonian asks, what are the state's plans for testing at long-term care facilities? Will all staff and all residents be tested? All residents and staff and facilities with one more diagnosed or symptomatic cases? When do you expect to start implementing those plans? Thank you for your time. Um, as you know, with the guidance that was updated last week and continues into this guidance, we have suggested that uh, a degree of testing of asymptomatic individuals in long-term care and other congregate facilities should be considered. What we do know is that this disease can be spread from those without symptoms, and we know that our congregate facilities have been the hardest hit. Tragically, about half of our deaths here in Oregon, as they have been in many other communities, um, are from settings like this. And we need to do what we can to know about the spread of the disease in these settings and to um, bring resources to help prevent that. OHA, DHS, and our local public health partners have been working aggressively with these facilities um, to come in um, and do infection control, but also to do these investigations. So, you know, currently, as we respond to each outbreak, we look at what's happening in the facility and we make recommendations based on the facility, but we have been doing testing of folks with and without symptoms in these facilities so we can see about the spread of this disease and refine our recommendations. Even if we test someone without symptoms and that test is negative, that tells us about a point in time. And that doesn't mean that they may not have the infection tomorrow or the next week. So that's why we are doing some of this testing, looking at what other states and communities are doing so we can learn how best to respond to deploy testing in these settings so that we can offer the best protection to the residents and the staff um, because we know these are some of our most vulnerable settings with some of our most vulnerable Oregonians. Next up, we have Dirk Vanderhart from OPB. Go ahead, Dirk. Hey, thanks, Governor. Um, I just want to make sure I understand uh, exactly which Eastern Oregon counties are you going to be Zooming with today? And I also wondered if any counties have satisfied the draft criteria you guys have put out there for opening up, which includes, you know, sign up from hospital officials, public health officials, and a vote of the county uh, operating board. Has anyone actually uh, submitted those types of materials to your office? Dirk, I'll get you, uh, yes, those materials have been submitted to our office. At this point in time, I can't respond to whether or not any of the counties have met all the criteria. Uh, we're meeting with regions, um, uh, three of the re hospital regions uh, this afternoon, and we'll get you the specific counties. I could probably spend a moment or two and name all of them, but I don't want to torture you. Okay, uh, can, I, can I also ask, just, okay, yeah, go for it. Do you have one more question, Dirk? I did, just really quickly. Um, there's going to apparently be some sort of demonstration at the Capitol tomorrow. Have you offered any guidance to the Oregon State Police uh, as to how they should handle that if there is some sort of egregious, uh, what some might call egregious violations of these social distancing norms we've created? Look, I understand that uh, Oregonians are frustrated and honestly scared. Um, I know folks are worried about how they're gonna be able to pay their rent uh, put food on their table and buy essential for their families. Um, I just would uh, ask folks as they operate uh, their uh, First Amendment right to free speech uh, to maintain uh, physical distancing, uh, wear masks, and be considerate of others. Thanks, sir. Next. So, no, no guidance to those. Uh, the, the superintendent uh, is very capable of handling the situation if need be. Thanks, sir. Next up, we've got Thank Margaret you. from the Portland Monthly. Go ahead, Margaret. Uh, hi there. I have a question about the additional 10,000 people who will receive um, testing kits uh, to get data about the symptom-free infections. When will those people be notified or invited? Um, is that a one-time part of the study, or is that something that will be repeated? Uh, and if so, with what frequency? Um, and then I know that the study involves monitoring for 12 months, but when will that part of the data about those 10,000 people, when will that data be released? So thank you for the question. You broke up a little bit. Let me come back to me if I didn't answer all your questions. So there will be 10,000 asymptomatic people within the 100,000 people who will be offered COVID-19 testing, PCR COVID-19 testing. We will test them serially based on availability of testing in order to map the spread of asymptomatic COVID in the state. Is there another question that we missed? Did you have another question? Margaret? Uh, when, will, when will that data um, be released? Will you be releasing oh, that oh. pieces? Yes. Of 
We will be working with the Oregon Health Authority on a weekly basis to share the data uh, and then uh, summarize that data for public uh, uh, dissemination. for taking my question. Um, it's about asymptomatic transmission of this disease. The WHO has said that 25% of COVID-19 cases are of asymptomatic people. There's studies that show it's 50, 60, 90% of people. Um, one study shows the transmission um, is it, it, the disease is transferred 44% of the time from asymptomatic people and infecting them. The CDC director, Robert Redfield, says that asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmitters are a significant reason this virus is rapidly spreading across, across the country. So my first question is part of contact tracing. Are asymptomatic people who've had contact with infected people going to be tested as part of the protocol? Um, so thank you for that question about asymptomatic spreading. We know there's a significant amount of spreading that can happen before people develop symptoms and when they don't have symptoms. As part of our contact tracing, as we identify those who've had contact with someone who's tested positive, those individuals will be recommended to stay at home and quarantine for 14 days. If they develop symptoms, they will be tested so we can determine um, if we need to do additional contact tracing. But for those who are asymptomatic, we're asking them to stay home so that even if they are infected without symptoms or they develop symptoms down the road, that they're not out in the community infecting others. And that hardship, we know, is, is, is going to have a tremendous impact on people. So we're working to identify what are the resources and services that we need to bring and have available for people who are under isolation or quarantine so that they can safely follow these recommendations for themselves, their families, and their communities. Oh. So, uh, follow up to that. Uh, uh, Amy? I want a country that has, you know, is it yeah. Amy? Amy, is it okay? Uh, Dr. Jacobs would like to chime in. Yeah, thank you for the question. I was just going to say that one of the, the benefits of this approach is that it, it will help us understand who. Some people call that hot spotting. But equally importantly, it will tell us where. And that's the mapping component that can be used to guide decision making. Uh, next up, Do, does she, she, she had, had a question about question. Taiwan. I'm sorry, I had a follow up. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so why not go ahead and test asymptomatic people? Um, because we know that it takes up to 14 days for the virus to um, to start showing some symptoms. Maybe those, some of those people start showing symptoms after 14 days. Why not test? 14 days doesn't seem like enough. Why not test those people? Do we not have the testing capacity? And shouldn't we have the testing capacity? before we reopen Oregon. No, and, and I think, you know, our recommendations may evolve, but we know that transmission occurs primarily in those 14-day period after someone is exposed. So as we identify someone with COVID-19, we, um, through a positive test, a referral in from their healthcare provider, we will work with them quickly to identify who they had contact with before they developed symptoms and while they were symptomatic. Those are the individuals that they put at risk for for, um, that they may have potentially exposed to COVID-19 and are at risk for coming down with the disease. Whether or not they have symptoms, that primarily occurs in those 14 days, and that's why we would ask them to stay home and quarantine so as not to expose others. Whether we did a test or not, that recommendation is going to remain the same, that they're staying home and they're, they're not exposing others. Again, as we learn more about this, we may do increased testing in those, but we feel that this approach to test all those who've had contact who are symptomatic to see whether or not they have COVID-19 and to keep all those, regardless of their symptoms at home and not spreading the disease, is a great tool for us in controlling the spread. As you've heard from those experts you, you quoted at the beginning, this is going to be difficult. You know, this is a disease that spreads relatively easy easily and a fair amount of that spread occurs from people without symptoms. So people need to work together with public health. We all need to be patient and we need to have the system to try and control the spread of disease. Uh, Charles, me, before you move on, Dr. Bangsberg yeah, would also like to add And let me in. just add that the key to Oregon study is an important complement to what OHA is collecting in terms of their contact tracing in that we are doing daily symptom monitoring so we can identify someone as soon as they develop symptoms, test them and then refer them to contact tracing and isolation if necessary, as well as follow people who are asymptomatic to see where asymptomatic spread is occurring. That will allow us to detect these clusters of transmission early, such that contact tracing by itself may be enough to control transmission. Thanks, 
Hi, thanks for having me. Um, Dr. Seidlinger, I have a question. You said infections will likely go up after the state begins to reopen. Um, is there is there going to be any point where resurgence of infections will cause the state to, to revert to stronger social distancing measures uh, to, to maybe where we are now um, if you see a certain percentage of, of cases spiking again? So as part of our criteria, as we worked with the medical advisory panel and our local public health partners and looking at guidance from national organizations and talking to other states, we, we want to continue to monitor this disease and, and continue to look for um, when we might be seeing increased disease. The reason I say infections are going to go up is because people are going to have more contact with others. Um, and with that contact comes infections, and with those infections are the possibility for serious infections that require hospitalizations. So that's why you'll see as recommendations come out that we are still going to be recommending that people stay six feet apart in most settings, that we cover our faces when we're in settings when we can't do that. Those tools are really going to help us um, slow down the spread of disease in our community, and our public health um, tracking and surveillance system is going to help um, additionally to keep that spread down. But we'll continue to monitor our um, emergency department visits, our new cases, our hospitalizations. The data that we receive from OHSU is part of their study that will look for clusters of symptomatic people, um, people who are testing positive because they've developed symptoms, and even those asymptomatic individuals. All are signs that we're going to be looking at to see if we have the resources, public health resources, hospital capacity to keep the disease under control. If we notice places, isolated places in communities, counties, or regions, or across the state where we're seeing increased diseases, we will be having conversations with the governor's office about what next steps we think we could take together to help control the spread of the disease. But all of us have a responsibility as we move forward to try and keep our distance, to wear um, face coverings when we're, we're out in many of these public places, to try and stay close to home and not you know, go to other parts of the state um, at this time, not take those vacations you know, we've been planning, but take this time to plan those vacations for later on um, when we have that. But we all have a role to play. We've all been playing that role, and I hope that we'll continue to play that role together and we won't need to re-implement those mitigation measures, but that's a conversation we're ready to have.